Next oh. up, uh, talk number two, we got Stephen Vincent talking about uh, custom um, component libraries with Angular and Storybook. So Stephen, take it away. So what I'm gonna be talking about right now is gonna be uh, component libraries uh, and how they can relate uh, to your company and how you should potentially be creating one in-house versus using a third party. So uh, as Aaron said, uh, my name is Steven. Um, I have been creating front end code, uh, intuitive design interfaces for many years now. Um, and with my company, I'm able to work on a multitude of different projects, different tech stacks. And I like to pull a little bit of knowledge that I, that I gain from each one of my clients and kind of just share that with the community. And uh, internal component libraries is just one of the more recent ones uh, that I decided to uh, share with you all. So. Um, everyone who creates software nowadays, if you're a front-end developer, um, is probably using some sort of uh, component library, whether that's Material or um, uh, Beautify or, or really any of the other uh, React, because I feel like React has a, a lot of great libraries as well. Um, but what happens is, is that there is always a tipping point in which your company says, you know, this is I've out, outgrown this, and, and I need to make something internal. So what does that entail? And that's what um, these four uh, steps can help you make that decision. Um, first that you need to do is find the smallest units uh, of work. You're already doing that inside your code, but now you need to abstract that out in, as far as your, your, your components work, right? So um, buttons, for example, uh, you, you, why would you want to pull out a button, right? Well, you style your button, you have your different click actions, you may have different states. So you have actually done a lot more with this very minimal component that is a candidate, it's a perfect candidate. So you want to start small and create a very good base foundation and start creating dependence onto your library um, and do that with the smallest units first. Um, styles are, are huge. Uh, every time you spin up a new project, you're probably copying over styles or you're using other projects uh, or even other features internally uh, to kind of help you style something similar to what the current ask is. So by globalizing your styles and putting them in one place, um, first off, if you have a design team, it will definitely help them because they can then go to that one-stop shop for all of your colors and, and themes. Um, and then it can also help your organization have a more general look and feel across all of your applications inside your software suite. Um, testing, uh, I think everyone uses the word TDD, um, but inside component libraries, it's actually really important. Um, I won't get into unit testing, but template testing and style testing are very important inside, inside component libraries. Um, because as you create these components, it's not just used inside that one piece of software. You are creating it in a general way to where you can use it in multiple different projects. And when you do that, you want to make sure at minimum you have a red flag system is what I call it. So if I am testing a specific um, style and making sure that it does this specific thing, and someone were to go in there and change something small, and this is a real world uh, instance, where they may change the positioning from uh, relative to, to absolute, that can make some really big breaking changes inside applications. So at minimum, it, it's nice to actually have like a flag, like, hey, you're changing this and it's in a library. So it's gonna go across uh, everyone when they version. Um, and lastly, the most important is gonna be showcasing. So you, you lose a lot of, of Honestly, the the use case for your your library, if you're not if you're not showcasing it, um, the benefit of, of of doing that is after you have uh, this this new shiny toy, you have to show them how they can use it. In the industry, that's that's known as the unknown unknown. How do they know what to ask if they don't know what the question is? So by providing a showcase at minimum, um, you can at least show them what you have to offer and what its capabilities are. The next step is actually identifying and creating these components inside the library. Um, and I follow the rule of three. So if you've used it three times, it's a perfect candidate to pull out and throw that inside your component library. And it should be a part of your entire Agile process. So as you're creating these, these features um, or even full applications, you should be considering, is that a candidate to pull out inside my library so that way I can reuse it or other people can reuse it within my organization. Um, the first step for identifying is it's really easy. I gave that button example, but there are also other candidates that, that you may not really see, but you use frequently. 
for example, if you have a side navigation, that is your, your company's primary style for navigation, you may only need it to develop it once in this application, but if you have lots of different applications, you may want to develop it inside your, your library. And so that way, whenever you spin up a new application, whether that's a prototype or uh, an enterprise level software, you're just pulling directly from your, your library. And that seems like a no brainer, but um, it, the benefit really comes from those big one-time use uh, features that you pull inside your application. When you have an ask like, what if I want that menu to be more mobile friendly, or if I want to add transitions, um, something that's going to fundamentally change the way that works. I now can change it in one place and then push it across my entire tech stack and everything just version bumps up and it all looks the same. It all interacts the same. Uh, ironically, the one that you would think would be the hardest is actually the easiest, just creating reusable library components. Um, every library has ways to do templates or slots uh, or generalizations, um, and, and you're already doing that. You just need to put it in a one place to reuse it. Uh, display, uh, that I've already mentioned that, that's showcasing it. Um, that is a way for people to not have to download uh, or clone that project and then look inside the code to understand how it works. It should be your one-stop shop to just have that picture say a thousand words. And lastly, the documentation. Um, your display, your showcase is your primary source of documentation. But you should also have some sort of additional documentation that kind of accentuates um, your, your component that, that, that's in there. Uh, specifically, if you have additional links, put it inside there as well. So that way, uh, they're not having to go seek out, OK, this uses an icon. but what icon? Where does it go? What, what icons are, are, are usable? Um, so any additional documentation, just try to incorporate that as well. Not, not talking about like lines of code, but specifically for documentation as they relate to your library. Um, a couple of real world examples is the misuse and misrepresentation of the word reuse um, or reusable code um, components, excuse me. Um, I am, I am just as guilty as this, but uh, a lot of us will become copy commandos because uh, a common situation that will happen is that uh, your team lead or someone in business uh, or your client will say, I need X feature. And the first thing the majority of us do is start breaking that down. Okay, there's this project where I did it over here, or I know uh, this developer did a very similar feature, so I'll get with him. And then after you start putting those pieces together, you start pulling down pieces of code. And more often than not, um, you end up copying that code and then making changes to it. Now, the problem with that is, is now you have two uh, versions that are separate. So when something needs to be changed, you now have to make it across two different um, uh, pieces of code. Even though they look and feel the same from the front end, from your user's perspective, but from a code standpoint, they're very disconnected. So it's better to spend, even if it's twice as long, um, to create that feature if you're pulling it out into your component library, because now they're all linked to the same area. Um, what I usually say is I kind of go back to that rule of three, but there's another one. It's the 50% rule. If you can reuse 50% of that code or when you copy it out, if you delete 50% or, or less, uh, probably a great candidate to pull inside your, your internal component library. The code segment that you see over here is actually a, a good example. This is my code from a couple years ago. Um, it's inside uh, Angular, and it's a, uh, a templatized version of a modal window. Now, I did a decent job at making it uh, uh, reusable within its own application, but I did not do a good job at making it reusable across all of my applications. So um, a modal is actually pretty easy to develop. Um, it's got three key parts. You got your header, you got your body, and you got your footer. Um, the header and the footer can be pretty standardized across your company. And then you can make just the, the, the inside, the body portion, uh, pretty generic to where you can just insert, slot, or template uh, inserts um, the majority of what that, that, that modal is going to do. Um, and I could easily pull that out. And so instead of having the one template that takes in a lot of code, I can have three different templates. And then right now, I mean, if I only just had a simple dialog box that had an X, it had a, a positive and negative button and an empty body, that's a great place to start. And then as you use it more in your other applications, other developers will realize, oh, maybe I want to hide the header um, because I wanted to have it more just visual and I don't want to actually have a close button. Or um, I want to have a positive, a negative, and then maybe a back button. Um, and I use that more often. So uh, it's never too early to just pull out as, as much as you can for MVP and then just know that it, it's an evolutionary and organic process. 
This last one's my favorite. Um, as a contractor, I, I get nosy and I poke around my client's code um, to kind of better acclimate to, to how they do things. And one of the things that I see often with people using third-party libraries is they outgrow them. And they do that in the way of styling and theming. Um, this is a very extreme example, but it happens quite often, um, is if you find yourself, um, you or your company, if you find your code is overriding or fighting against the styles of a component library that you're using, um, that's a huge red flag that you've outgrown it. That's not to say that you need to make a hard shift from that library to um, an internal one and then completely get rid of it. But maybe the ones that you see that you're overriding like this would be a perfect candidate to just say, hey, okay, I'm doing this on uh, this these cards and I'm having to make them flat. I'm having to make them with no outlines. Um, and, and you start like fighting with these things and, and creating global styles to override them entirely. Do exactly that. Override them, rebuild them, um, but throw them in your component library so you never have to do that again. And no one else has to do it again. Uh, the last thing before I show you a real world example is uh, creating value for your component. Um, it's a really hard sell, and I, I realize that because um, it's hard to tell your boss or business um, this free thing that does 50% of the work isn't cutting it anymore. I need actually more time and more money on some of my features right now uh, to provide benefit for the company in the future. Um, but that's why you need total company buy-in because it's not just a developer tool. It's, it's a company tool. Business is going to use it. Um, uh, designers are going to use it if you have a design team. Uh, and of course, the developing team is going to use it. The best way I can give um, a suggestion is when you have that conversation with your team um, and ultimately with, with business um, is uh, the support. When bugs or enhancements need to be made um, as they stand right now, you're going to have to make them across your, your suite and then you have to plan accordingly. If you have them already pulled out into your own component library, you have control over that. And so you can make that change in one place. And then when those individual applications are ready for those changes, they just version bump up. And that maintenance cycle is a lot less and it's a lot cheaper to introduce enhancements and it's a lot faster to produce, to, re to reduce and fix bugs. Um, I mentioned design and dev uh, and business, but design and dev, uh, there's a Venn diagram that perfectly describes the, the, the the use case for this. Um, designers have everything that they want and developers uh, show everything that the current technology they have and they meet in the middle. Uh, and they, when they meet in the middle, that should be your component library. So um, if for some reason the designers want to know if they have something, they go to your showcase and they can see what they have. They see their own capabilities. It reduces the conversation that you have to have that back and forth between development and design because you can say, these are the Legos that we currently have for you to play with. And if they say they want something new, then the developers can say, this is what I need. And then they go to business and say, this is what they need for me to do my job and for all of us to kind of like work together and create that solution. Um, and lastly, if your shop, this is kind of a bonus. If your shop does a lot of prototyping, um, I've worked in a lot of shops that do this. Um, it's more standard for a lot of startups. But if you're doing it through your own uh, projects as well, it benefits you. But you can create much faster, cleaner, and universal prototypes when you have an internal library. because. I can't tell you how many times prototypes become production because they work and they're already ready, so ship it. Uh, unfortunately, um, that can produce, if you're using a third-party library, a lot of not consistent looks and feels for, for applications. And, and it's really easy with how fast technology works is to kind of not go back and fix those. Whereas if you started with an internal library that already has your themes, um, your common uh, functionality, and your common components, built into them and baked in there. If you ever want to go back, if it was version one when, when you created it and now your library is at version 10, you just version bump up and then now you have access to all these new, new components that you can start hot swapping into place. So um, it, it, it definitely makes that process a lot faster. Um, I'm a big Angular developer and I found something really cool that I love to, to, to demo real quick. So I'll just take a couple minutes real quick to kind of show um, uh, an Angular implementation uh, using Storybook. So let me switch over to that real quick. All right, my Chrome tab finally popped up. 
Okay, so uh, storybook from a high, very high level uh, way is it, I, I did not want to actually spin up another project and then make links to this and then have to like program every single uh, component that I created. So what it allows me to do is, is in, in in Angular now storybook is is was originally created for React, but they now support a multitude of different um languages so i'm not gonna uh try to promote that or sell it because there are a lot of other showcasing software it's just the one that i decided to go with because i found it to be the easiest to spin up quickly um but out of the box um if i create my component library in angular i can easily import those components as if i were importing them into a project and then by simply adding a few um uh, HTML tags, I, I have all of this. Uh, I didn't program any of this. This is all just linking um, my, my component library. So all I added were these stories over here on the left. So um, going to each one of those key concepts, I'll kind of go through them real fast, um, is as you see here, I have my different showcases for my different components. And underneath each one of these components, I have the different states and the capabilities that are here. So um, I have them. Uh, appropriately named, but you have your theme, your disabled, you have your click actions, so that way you can actually see um, when my browser decides to, to kick in. Um, whenever I can actually click it, it'll actually display down here in the actions um, what the user is going to be um, seeing. Um, this is really important because this allows other developers to kind of, like I said before, um, play around with it and find its capabilities. And if they, they go, I wonder if that button can do this, it should be here, at least the current version. And if it's not here, then they know that that's that that should be them. I'm going to create that, and that adds to their complexity whenever they create that feature. So if they they need to add something, for instance, if if the a ghost button, which is what I nicknamed this, wasn't available and design wanted it, it'd be really easy for them to restyle that, throw that on here, and then add it to this library. So now they have it for the remainder of this this library. So. Um, the next thing is, is, is the API and the documentation. And I, I have a perfect example over here um, inside my icon button. Um, over here inside the documentation, what's really important is not only the visual aspect, but also what its capabilities are. So again, I did not create any of this. This is out of the box with Storybook. Um, I linked my component. It automatically uses reflections to pull in all of uh, the inputs and outputs and display it here. Um, also, and there's there's a, a multitude of different plugins that you can to, can use to make this process easier. This is just the out of the box version, but you can also show the actual code on how this relates uh, from the visual, from the API, and now how I can actually utilize it inside my HTML template. Um, and all of that being said is within reach of here, and I didn't have to uh, download a, a a project and actually dive into it, um, or even use a, another project and another feature to be able to better understand what these components are. And the last thing I want to show is um, you can add additional documentation here. This is just real simple that uh, this icon button does use icons, um, but I don't create them. Um, but I need to be able to display what they are. This is material IO, but I could easily have put feather icons on here or flat icons or internal icons as well. Um, and you could add Markdown, you could add a wiki, or you could even link it to your own Confluence pages or internal pages as well. But this allows you just kind of like a free text field, just add whatever it is, further increasing the, the usability uh, of your library instead of having to uh, expect your users to know where to go from here. But that's it. Um, I actually haven't loaded up this project uh, onto GitHub, but I can easily do that if, 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 if there's need for it, if, if there's want. Um, so just shoot me uh, a message inside our Slack channel. We want to get as many people inside our, our uh, uh, OKC Web Devs channel because um, we're always talking and always shooting ideas. So uh, without further ado, I will um, let you guys hear from Aaron.